Welcome to the 74th episode of Dialoga, a podcast between two friends about the latest, or in this case, not so latest, on society, feminism, and politics in Indonesia and the world. I'm Stephanie Tangkilisan. And I'm Suyidian Lee. And this week, we're going to dig into history and talk about one of the lesser known uh, founding fathers of Indonesia, Sultan Shahir. Lesser known to us, maybe you know more, maybe you're a history buff, and we should be ashamed. Also, listeners, if any of you are proper historians and you think we got things wrong, take, please correct us. <laughs> please correct us. Take us apart. Take everything we say with a grain of salt. We're very earnest. We're trying to do the Flimsy, right thing. Flimsy but earnest logic. Here we um, go. But yeah, we're going to talk about who he is and some of our thoughts and reflection of his ideas about nationalism and democracy. I think it's incredibly important, certainly in today's times, where uh, the concept of a democracy is always tenuous, uh, to think about how some of the earliest figures of our country thought about democracy and really considered the future of Indonesia beyond just the fight for independence. So here's to it. So, listeners, you, uh, as as you probably know, you haven't heard any new content from us for uh, a few weeks now. Uh, yeah, we uh, both Sweden and I have big life changes. Yeah. Um, for one, Sweden, you want to tell the listeners your personal news? Yeah. So, listeners, at the end of the month, I'll be moving back to Indonesia again <laughs> for the second time. <laughs> I just feel like I'm like. I just go back and forth. But this time, I am actually moving out of my own free will instead of the visa expiring. So you're going home for good. Mm-hmm. But this time, it's I chose to decide that my time is up. But anyways, I'm moving back to Jakarta. And Stephanie... Meanwhile, I have moved to California. <laughs> so I'm now living in the Bay Area. So no longer in New York for work-related reasons. I have new projects here. Mm-hmm. So... Both of us are um, living in boxes right now, so that's kind of why we've been missing. Pretty much. Um, but we're here, and we're excited to be back. Mm-hmm. And once Sweden is back in Indonesia, you'll have more news, more interviews with people moving and shaking Indonesian politics and activism and feminism. So looking forward to that content. Yeah, and we're now in the month of August, and we figured we're going to try something a little bit different from our usual episodes. Since this is the month of August, it's also the month of Independence Day. Independence Day! Yeah, and we decided that earlier in the days of Dialogica, we used to do these profile episodes where we talked about a historical figure that we don't know that much about or we think that the public don't know that much about. And we're going to go back to that for this month. Yeah, we're going to talk about Sutan Shahrir, who... Um, is one of Indonesia's heroes and father of our independence movement. And I feel like the least known of the key figures to Indonesia's independence movement. Yeah. And um, someone who I've looked at briefly at his works and I've been really interested in, but never really got a chance to dig deeper. So that's what we're doing today. And it's been fascinating to, to look into him. Especially, you know, since I, I'm not going to speak for Stephanie, but I have a very, very low level understanding of Indonesian history and I cop out to that and I admit to that so it was great to just like really dig deep into the details of the independence movement yeah the early days of the Indonesian Republic and how crucial Sutan Shahrir was as a figure not only for establishing the new government but also making sure that it survives past the first you know couple of administrations Mm -hmm. anyway uh just the basic facts um, super briefly, uh, Sutan Shahrir was born on March 5th, 1909 in Padang in Sumatra. Shout out to and Sumatra. he... My family's from Sumatra, even though I'm a Jakarta kid. Represent. And he died, unfortunately, uh, pretty early at age 57 in April 1966 in Zurich, Switzerland. And we'll actually go into further into his death because that's kind of a pretty tragic part of his, um, story. Mm-hmm. But he's kind of most notably his um, positions 
an office in Indonesian government. He was the first prime minister of Indonesia from 1945 to 1947, and the second interior minister of Indonesia from 1945 to 1946. Mm -hmm. um, he was also, at the same time, uh, the... Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Indonesia from 1945 to 1947. As we can see, there's a lot of overlap in time here. And um, this is what happens when you have a new democracy. Like literally new. And you're like, who's going to do all these things? Oh, I guess you. <laughs> and then who's going to do that? And then you again. Yeah, pretty much. But um, when he was appointed prime minister, he was actually the youngest prime minister in the world when he was 36. Mm -hmm. So he was kind of like the younger of the tree of, of Sukarno and Hatta. And I think this is one of the things that I noticed um, as, a, as we were doing our research that I was astounded by is that he is arguably the third most important person in yeah. the establishment of the new government yeah. after the president and the vice president. He was the prime minister. And yet we don't know that much about him. Yeah, for sure. Uh, a little bit more about him. Um, his father was a chief public prosecutor in Medan and an advisor to the Sultan of Delhi. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, he studied at the prestigious ELS in Mulo and then AMS in Bandung. And he was also a violinist. Um, and he was also actually, uh, well, he was an AMS in Bandung. He was also involved in the theater community. Okay, so where he I was a director, a playwright, and an actor. And I'm like, okay, all future um, important people come out of the theater, so... Watch this space. Okay, so <laughs> anyway, then he went to uh, study in the Netherlands, where he went to the University of Amsterdam, and then became a law student at Leiden, where yeah. he got a lot of uh, colonial education, <laughs> but but led to him being like having an important role in the Sumpa Pemuda and the Youth Congress, which led to his like political activities in the Netherlands and getting to know Hatta. Uh, Muhammad Hatta, the future prize president of Indonesia. This is where he was, and um, this is fascinating, right? Actually, like considering like how many of these um, young activists who went to school in the Netherlands yeah. got to know everybody, and so, yeah. sort of like in the colonial um, embrace is when you start to think about the independence movement. Like so many of the young activists and the key figures of the independence movement all gathered in that crucial period in the 20s and 30s in the Netherlands. And I was just like, ooh, things are happening. <laughs> yeah, this has been a really exciting time. I feel like if I can time travel, it's definitely a time where I would want to like, masquerade as a man and like be a fly in the wall. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so since he was had all these revolutionary activities, he didn't actually finish his law degree. And then he went back Who to Who needs Indonesia. a law degree anyways? <laughs> in 1931 to set up the Indonesian National Party and um, then Hatta came back and they both were uh, arrested by the Dutch. Because they were actively trying to create uh, a new government, I guess, maybe? <laughs> yes. Yes. And then... Um, and when the Japanese came to power, uh, a lot of these uh, originally exiled prisoners by the Dutch were freed. But then obviously, you know, Sukarno, Hatta, and Sharir start to really amp up the independence movement because they saw that this was a crucial time mm -hmm. to really break free from the 300 plus years of Dutch rule. Of colonial occupation. Yes. Um, so here they chose like kind of an interesting tactic, I feel like this is one of the diversions of mm -hmm. like Hatta and Shadri's like kind of like hand in hand activism. Yeah. Um, Sukaro and Hatta decided to have a cooperation with the Japanese and kind of like try to negotiate and like push for the independence from the inside, whereas Chari was like, no, we are not going to start continuing with the occupier. I know. They're also colonialists. True. But he also had tuberculosis, so that was, uh, did not help. <laughs> he also had Lilo <laughs> just for personal sake. <laughs> yeah, but I think it was super interesting. And in a lot of his own work, he's always just like, do not compromise with the oppressor. And that's mm -hmm. very much like Chari. He's, he's such a spirited individual. And, um, like, I kind of imagine him as, like, the Indonesian Hamilton, like, mm -hmm. like saying, I'm not going to throw away my shot, and then, like, not going to cooperate with the Japanese occupiers. It's just, like, so dramatic in my head. You read history as a musical. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it is fascinating, right? Because he is a figure that is so convicted to his beliefs. And in this particular instance, he was, like, cooperating with the Japanese is the same thing as cooperating with the Dutch. We're cooperating with our oppressors. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, when... You after I've done my research, I, I almost saw it as like 
in that time period when Hata and Sukarno were were working with the Japanese mm-hmm. and Shatter was working on his own covertly underground, that's almost like the beginning of the, the split. The split between Sukarno and Shahir, who have vastly different ideas about what the future of Indonesia is going to be. So what I found fascinating, obviously you've got Sukarno as sort of like the spearhead mm-hmm. of the independence movement, right? He is this charismatic leader that is that can galvanize and can rally people very easily. That's right. that's always been Sukarno's strong suit. He's always so charming. But you also need somebody like Sultan Shahir who can negotiate and can be diplomatic when things get tricky and complicated and you need to play nice or you need to bluff a little bit. Mm-hmm. And that was crucial in creating the new government and i feel like that that sort of like diplomatic approach doesn't get enough credit in the in the future storytelling of our the birth of our nation like yeah we always think about sukarno as like oh he did, he's the guy who did everything right. and everybody else is just like oh we're just supporting him when in fact <laughs> a lot of things were happening in the background that was as crucial as sukarno being the spearhead of all of this i think he was kind of like one of the few people immune to sukarno's charisma in a way right like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. even though he's like younger and i mean i'm sure hata was too but i feel like he sukarno and hata had such a closer relationship yeah than than he and charu that i think led to the tension between him and sukarno um not that there wasn't any beforehand there was always before you know 1945 there's always a tension of where they differ mm-hmm. but it just they had a common enemy right yeah so once they this common enemy was gone mm-hmm. and Sukarno increasingly wanted to push guided democracy forward which is that you know mm-hmm. when he did disband elections and decided oh i'm gonna be president for the next <laughs> 20 years so whenever we decide to so yeah. whenever um and Shari had just such a like mind of like we're gonna have a fair democratic process and we're gonna have a parliament that is not controlled by the president and will have a healthy democracy. And um, that was kind of the difference. And that definitely led to him being exiled by Sukarno. Yes. I mean, uh, in case you missed it. Sorry. I, I like didn't know Shadir history. But then when I found this out, I was just like, ah, et to Sukarno. Shadir was only prime minister for, for two years. And that was not because... He didn't want to be prime minister for loggers because he was forced out of government yeah. because his views were so different from Sukarno's views. Yeah. Luckily for us, I think, luckily for Indonesia right now, is that um, he was able to be the prime minister at first and establish uh, almost a foundation of parliamentary democracy that is mm-hmm. that can survive past Sukarno, right? that can survive past one charismatic leader. Yeah. I mean, it took us a few decades to really get that. <laughs> to le- really learn that I lesson. Mean, are we still there? Oh man, this is I this know, is a. <laughs> I know, right? But he, I think he should be credited for laying out such a foundation for the DPR and like mm-hmm. balance of power that we have the outlines for in theory. Um, yeah, I, I think this is a really important quote from him. Like this is what he said in our struggle. Mm-hmm. Um, or Kita, a national revolution is only the result of democratic revolution. A nationalism should be second to democracy. The state of Indonesia is only a name we give to the essence we intend to aim for. Yeah. So here, I think the important thing is that like he places democracy as the first thing, mm-hmm. a- as opposed to nationalism. And I think that's such an important lesson to note. In, yeah. Even in today's Indonesia, right? Like I feel like so often the idea of nationalism, like and uh, kaira hagamati, or Indonesia is number one. That's the end of it. Um, mm-hmm. It's such contrary to this democracy principle because, like, I think even in Jokowi's times, right, there are a lot of civil liberties that are being erased um, for the sake of nationalistic agendas or like national building of infrastructure. Like, it's almost like there. Whenever we don't prioritize democracy and use the notions of nationalism to supersede all of like 
these kind of principles of democracy, this is how we end up with authoritarianism. And yeah. like, that's kind of like, okay, with the communist purge that Suharto did, it's like, oh, nationalism, we need to protect our country. And it's such a rhetoric that's so often used that we forget what the order of priorities should be. Because mm -hmm. if you want to have a healthy state, like, we should, I think, have democracy because to like curb the impulses of the dictator, right? Um, Or hold whoever's in power accountable. Yeah. And I agree with you, right? Like because the conversations of nationalism versus democracy It's so dangerous. Clearly is still ha is still happening, right? In this year's election, yeah. that was a crucial part of the conversation. And I think it's worthwhile to read up more about Shadir's legacy and you know, these are the same issues and problems that the founding fathers of our nation thought about. Yeah. I, sometimes I'm I'm thinking like, what if Shire wasn't around? Like, you know, knowing Sukarno's like charismatic force, he's probably like bulldoze everyone. I mean, he kind of did. Yeah, <laughs> he did. But like, probably our constitution would be a different thing yeah. than it is now. Mm -hmm. You know, we might not have such a strong foundation for parliamentary systems and for better or for worse. <laughs> as much of a division for better or for worse. But the thing is, right? There's a foundation for something to hold people accountable, mm -hmm. and. Uh, I forget whose quote is it, but you know, uh, somebody said once that like democracy is an imperfect tool, right? Uh -huh. And this is this is our ways of trying to make sure that we have the best possible version of this imperfect tool uh -huh. for for future generations. I mean, like, part of the rest of the thing of our struggle is Shatter's fairly socialist views mm -hmm. and, like, the decrying of capitalism and, like, how a lot of he uses the terms that are, like, probably will be outlawed by Suharto. Let's just put it that way. Um, I mean, if he was still around when Suharto was in power. <laughs> he would still end up in jail. Yep, he would still be in exile. But that's, you know, that's, like, a nice segue into, like, the, his life after government right where uh -huh. you know the, the first chunk of his life was dedicated to establishing a new republic and then going through the first rough years and then after that he started the Partai Socialist Indonesia yeah or the Indonesian Socialist Party yeah and also that's done in opposition to the communist Indonesian Communist Party or the PKI Partai Komunis Indonesia mm -hmm. um that kind of shows like he's like so not a communist that he's like, oh, you're going to create a communist party? I'm going to create a socialist party. Like, <laughs> Literally, it was like in direct opposition because he was concerned about the growing influence. And this was also, uh, for context for our listeners, right? This was the period when there were, um, this was obviously during the Cold War. Yeah. So communism was, was all around the place. <laughs> And there were concerns that uh, Sukarno was embracing the communist faction too much, etc., etc. So yeah. it also contributed to the existing tensions between Shariar and Sukarno mm -hmm. because Sukarno was clearly courting the communist bloc. Yeah. But it's fascinating, right? Because he is talking about, you know, socialism and communism are concepts that are like side by side in many different ways. Yeah. Like they're, they're born out of similar concerns but manifest into two different products. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes I'm always like, As somebody who's into like political science, it's always fascinating to see how much people right. uh, try to create oppositions out of things that were perhaps right next to each other when they were first born. <laughs> right. And I mean, like, Shadow was also super sassy. Like, <laughs> shout out. Like, his quote against Sukarno, which honestly is like, damn. Like, <laughs> I mean, maybe you guys are like thinking we're like doing this so irreverently but i feel like this is the kind of content you come here for i mean yeah if um, you're surprised by this then you must be new here <laughs> um, but anyway this is what he said nasionalisme yang sukarno bangun di atas solidaritas hierarkis feudalis sebenarnya adalah fasisme musuh terbesar dari kemajuan dunia dan rakyat kita Damn, damn, calling it. Snap, snap. <laughs> All right, so this is related to his own nationalism. It's like, this, this nationalism thing is dangerous. Um, mm -hmm. Nationalism that Sukarno is building is built on the solidarity of hierarchy and feudalism. And it is, by another name, fascism. It is the biggest enemy towards the progress of our world and our people. Like, drop mic. <laughs> like, 
<laughs> also, I, this gets us excited. Like, that's kind of sort of like strong so much political. drama, man. And it's like, but that's the thing, right? It's so true because anyway, uh, nationalism, nationalism without a purpose is fascism. Yeah, <laughs> it's just power for power's sake, being used however way you want it to be, and and so forth. Mm-hmm. And whatever this nationalism ends up being, this victory of nationalism ends up being empty for most for the people. Mm-hmm. And it's like, yeah, like who wins in like nationalistic kind of fights, right? Yeah. We can all be mobilized by nationalism, but in the end, like who wins by that? Like it ends up being like a lot of the people lose out on on, on this fight for nationalism. And it's like I mean, so that's the thing, right? Like nationalism is a useful concept, perhaps in struggles and fights uh when you're trying to sort of like yeah. establish yourself you're trying to like yeah. rise up in a revolution but nationalism i feel like is a concept that is not sustainable without something like democracy otherwise then you're just always rallying the troops but but for what and for whose benefit right the Seperti jenazah diangkat meninggalkan kemayoran. Ya, Tuhan telah membebaskannya dari derita lahir dan batin. Dia adalah Sultan Syahir yang menghembuskan nafasnya yang terakhir pada usia 57 tahun karena penyakit tekanan darah tinggi. Kibaran sang merah putih setengah siang pertanda bahwa negara ikut bergabung. Sejak tahun 1962 hingga akhir hayatnya, Sultan Syahrir hidup dalam pengasingan dari masyarakat ramai sebagai akibat pertentangan pandangan dan pelaksanaan politik negara. Partai Sosialis Indonesia di mana ia menjabat ketua umumnya dinyatakan sebagai partai terlarang dan ia bersama kawan-kawan sepahamnya terpaksa menjalani hidup yang jauh dari segala aktivitas politik. Sebagai seorang yang selalu hidup dalam gerak dinamikanya politik, proses pengasingan yang berlarut-larut ini Akhirnya menimbulkan penyakit tekanan darah tinggi yang meningkat hingga melemahkan syaraf lidahnya. Ia tak berdaya lagi mengeluarkan sepatah kata pun. Ya, puncak derita ini ia tanggung dalam kesenian harapan. Like I was looking at uh, old archival images and and video clips of him, and it's like this. He just seems like a guy who's who's humble. Yeah. But obviously committed to the cause. Yeah. Um, anyway, the, his, he stopped ha- holding office um, when he founded the Indonesian Socialist Party. So even though it is kind of leftist and believes in the critics of Marx and Engels based on like capitalism, they really didn't like the Soviet Union. Which is and tough so during those few, times. <laughs> Yeah, so I guess that's why he didn't get any funding from anywhere. He's yeah. like, I believe in the cap- co- like Marxist critique of capitalism, but you know that is because he believes in like the dignity of human human beings and like the fact that people should be not exchanged from their labor, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and the equality of men. Um, mm-hmm. Anyway, because of that, mm-hmm. um, he ultimately failed to get enough votes to to compete in the general election. And I believe like. He went this path also because he had such a belief in a parliamentary democracy, and if he wanted to have a country with his ideals, he'll want to be a part of a political party. Yeah, you know that really proves that a democratic system can work in Indonesia. Mm-hmm. Like he didn't want to just buy his way into power or anything, right? Like he wanted yeah. to go through the the steps yeah. and do it quote unquote legally. Yeah. Um, so, and his relationship during this time with Sukarno really failed. And, um, by 1962, he was, uh, was imprisoned by Sukarno, his old pal. Um, on and quote unquote imprisoned. conspiracy charges, which yeah. basically um, means I don't like you. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, imprisoned without trial. And then he suffered a stroke. Mm-hmm. And I think at this point, it's like, I don't understand why Sukarno was so threatened. Because I feel like Shatter failed creating a political party. Yeah. Maybe I'm totally missing the dynamics of 1960s politics. But I think this is one of those things where Sukarno just didn't want anyone criticizing him. And like he just gained so much power that he doesn't want even anything. Mm-hmm. That questions his legitimacy, mm-hmm. especially yeah. from someone with such a 
you know, revolutionary pedigree is shattered. And yeah, I mean, this is ultimately really tragic because in 1965, before the communist purge stuff happened, Mm -hmm. um, he actually suffered a stroke in prison. So he was like, I think he had high blood pressure and he wasn't allowed to bring his own food. Didn't have, they didn't allow his family to bring him his own food and like suffered a stroke. And then after when he insulted injury, after he suffered a stroke and other prisoners noticed, the prison guards were just like, oh, he'll be fine. Like he'll wake up from it tomorrow. And then like, just like yeah. didn't have any like doctor or anything, anybody check up on him until like the next day when the next person was in charge and then the doctor came and then like, um, he had a stroke. It was serious. And then he was like, you know, taken to the national hospital. And Sukarno was like, oh, oops. And like paid for all the services. And his family really fought to have him be treated outside. And that's how he was taken to Zurich. And ultimately, um, he died there in April 1966. Yeah, it's really sad. You know what's interesting as well, though? Is that obviously there was so much tension between him and Sukarno and the government. Yeah. Uh, but then when when Shahrir died in Switzerland uh, and news reached Indonesia, the government then immediately declared him as a national hero. Pahlawan National. Yeah, he's no longer a threat now that he's dead. Yeah. Once he's no longer a threat, then his narrative can be taken over by the government. Like, oh, he is this national hero who who fought so hard. He's the smiling diplomat. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, erase the whole part. It can be utilized. About him being at odds with Sukarno and be like, oh, let's just remember him for his glory days as the, one of the first people of the New Republic. Right. And he's being used against the whole thing that he was, like, against. The fact that, like, he doesn't want to, like, co-sign his name to nationalism if it meant, like, the death of democracy. Like... Is this kind of like the uh-huh. worst case scenario? He doesn't want to. He doesn't want to feed into cult of personalities, right? Like that's his whole thing. It's like we need to make democracy for the people, socialism for the people. It's about the people. Indonesia is a huge country, full of lots of people. <laughs> think of the people. Yeah, and I think even today, you know, it's his name is not heard as often as other revolutionary figures. Yeah. Even though he was such a crucial. Uh, advocate for democracy, like true democracy in Indonesia. Honestly, to this day, right, we still not we're still not sure if we're anywhere near that yet. Mm, we're trying. I don't think so. we're, <laughs> we're trying. We're trying. Some people are trying. Some people are trying, and even you know today, uh, with the with the new incarnation of Pasi, which has nothing to do really with with his no, incarnation. Not uh, at all. But uh, it, I I think the current Pasi is way less. Left socialist, yeah, way less. Left. <laughs> way way less socialist too. Yeah, um, but that's the thing. I think it's it's worthwhile, listeners, if you have the time and resources, like really reading up on all these like early uh, political thoughts of these figures. Yeah, with Shariar in particular, like his idea of like socialism kerakyatan, which I think is so unique to Indonesia. Like, how do you create a socialism for the masses, for the people, in this very tenuous? place where like not only do you have a, a huge country of islands a diverse country exactly it's diverse and there's already like internal tensions between the islands and then between the ethnic groups like how do you create yeah. uh, a system that works for everyone and obviously we're still nowhere near that yet but it's always a good reminder yeah please do read up on him because he's such a amazing mm-hmm. man that i'm sorry it took us to make this podcast to realize how cool and inspiring this guy is you know what i realized though is like we did an episode in hatta maybe our first year of Geologica. i'm sorry listeners that it took us another three years before we we're like let's cover another three years we really didn't cover another another historical yeah, figure Lord. okay if you guys like this kind of historical figure breakdown let us know and then slash we'll, rambling uh <laughs> we'll try to do more of them Thank you so much for listening to this episode. You can find more information and resources of whatever we talked about on our website, dialika.id. 
Music credits to John Dealey, Lee Rosevere, and of course, Broke for Free. If you like what you hear and want to support us, please review our podcast on the Apple Podcast app or whatever app you use to listen to your podcast. And please share our podcast with your friends. It's the best way to spread the word about Dialogica. If you want to get more involved, we'd love to hear from you. Our email is dialogicapodcast at gmail.com or just shoot us a message on our Facebook page. You can also find us on Instagram, YouTube, SoundCloud, and on Twitter. Please follow us on these various platforms. Our Twitter handle is at dialogicapod. Also, follow me on Twitter. It's Steph Tank. That's S-T-E-P-H-T-A-N-G-K. Thank you again and see you guys next time. Bye!